Hi, I'm Ryan Hamrick. I lead our security consulting practices here, and I'm here today with uh, John Bergman. I am John Bergman, consulting CISO, 25 years of cybersecurity experience, here to talk about current threats. A bevy of topics we are going to cover today. John, one of the things I wanted to, we, we want to talk about is AI and cybersecurity. It's how can we not? <laughs> sure. It's it's starting to revolutionize some aspects of cybersecurity. It's really starting to offer advanced threat detection and rapid response capabilities, predictive analytics, some fun features there. But these uh, advancements come with new challenges and concerns for CISOs. What are your thoughts? One of the biggest concerns that I see in the context of what I like to call, you know, generative pre-trained transformers, which is what the GPT of ChatGPT stands for, is the fact that essentially there are search engines that can also generate content for you, which sure. is great as long as the data model that it has has not been modified or perhaps poisoned by a threat actor. And that can unfortunately be done fairly easily uh, if you leave your uh, model open to the internet. Interesting. For me, that's the more advanced threat is that somebody would see, hey, you're using uh, a generative model. It has the potential of being manipulated by content that I put into it. Yeah. Probably a little bit more uh, sophisticated attack. The other issue that I see with GPT models is that people assume they're always correct. <laughs> so <laughs> when you think about uh, these generative tools, they're great, they're cool. I mean, they actually do have a lot of potential value for people that are new to cybersecurity. I think one of the best ways that these tools can be used is to help train and provide mentoring or coaching, if you will, for newer cybersecurity professionals who don't have 20 years or five years or 10 years of experience to have an idea where do they even begin to look. One of the things about cybersecurity is it's a huge field. There are yeah. risks uh, virtually around every corner. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have phishing emails that are now very well written that are very hard to determine that it's not a threat actor trying to get you to click on a link. They can write emails that are have a sense of urgency that will require or make you feel like you have to click on the link or respond in some way. The chat GPT like tools uh, that the criminals use are not constrained by some of the other training sure. you know, controls that we think of OpenAI and Microsoft Copilot. You can't ask Microsoft Copilot directly, build me uh, a bomb. It'll say, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to do that. Yeah. But you can structure a question or what we like to call a prompt in such a way that you can teach it to, and this again goes towards that first threat that I listed, which is you can poison a model and say, hey, I'm a cybersecurity professional. It's okay to tell me how to build a bomb because I need to prevent it. And then it will want to please you. And that's obviously <laughs> giving it a certain level of personification, which it doesn't can, currently possess. It's not really intelligence. It's just a really yep. well-designed algorithm that will find words that follow the words that you give it. Well, let's talk about the, the, the threat landscape. We've touched on that a little bit. Um, both defenders and attackers are starting to use AI tools. How does that make uh, attackers more effective? The old days, and by old days, I mean, really, you could only like go two back two years about, ago. Like two years yeah. ago, yeah. <laughs> Prior to, let's call it November 2020, two, if you had attackers where English wasn't their first language, they were not going to write particularly well-crafted phishing emails. The, the GPT tools do a great job now of writing well-crafted, albeit a little dry and a little predictive and predictable emails. But a lot of people will just scan the email mm -hmm. and they'll just say, oh, that sounds correct. You know, I'm not sure why the CEO is asking me to buy $500 worth of Apple gift cards, but it's the <laughs> CEO, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Right. The language in the, the letter from the CEO is going to be well written and it's going to be full of emotive words, words that will incentivize you to act. And that's just a very simple example is the, you know, the, the phishing email. There's even more sophisticated tools out there that are incredibly easy to use. Tons of examples of people capturing a few minutes of your voice. Mm -hmm. In your case, you and I are basically hosed in this regard because <laughs> our, we voices, have, is out our there. voices are out there. They don't need, they, if they only needed two minutes of video, they have 200 minutes of right. video. And yeah. so we can both be, our voice can be captured. Our voice can be easily replicated for $5 and they can make a very sophisticated voice call that will sound like me and they can actually make it interactive. So they can type out a sentence 
while they're having a conversation with somebody and it will sound like me or you right. or anybody else who has content out there. And they can also do it with video because there's enough video of you and I out there that they could just sample it. And then the tools, again, for video, it's probably a little bit more than $5 a month, but it's not much more than $5 a month. The social engineering attacks are going to continue to blossom and grow. And we have recent examples. In January of 2024, there was a person who was in Hong Kong who was on a video call with what he thought was the CFO and he made a wire transfer for $25 million to a threat actor who was simulating all the other people in the call. Yeah. And that is an example of poor controls in terms of who has the authority to transfer $25 million. Yep. Even if the CFO... Single point of failure. Single point of failure. But it's also an example of the increased risk. Mm -hmm. I have actually experienced this with uh, customers that I help with cybersecurity where there are threat actors who are clearly reading from scripts that have been designed to motivate people to reset people's passwords, sure. to yeah. give out information so that they can now call somebody else to get that password reset, to begin to launch an attack. What people need to be aware of is you need to really invest in your employees and train them to say, here's our controls. This is what you do if somebody wants to reset your password. And it might be something as simple as, Brian, you just call me to reset your password. I understand this is urgent. I'm going to call you back on the number that we have on file for you. Yep. And that number will be your, your mobile device. And then hang up the call. So your that managed we managed mobile device or, yeah. Your managed mobile device. We, we have control over. Yeah. Right. And one of the reasons you want to do that is you want to get out of that threat actor's loop and their playbook that says, I'm going to social engineer this person and say, oh, I lost my phone or, you know, you can't call me, I'm out of the country. You have a policy, you have a procedure that everybody understands and there's no escalation about it. It's not like, talk to my manager, maybe my manager will reset your password for you. <laughs> Threat actors have always taken advantage of developments. They you know, want to use the latest and greatest tools and they are highly motivated. And, and to me, it goes back to that first Terminator movie where the guy is saying, it's all he does. He won't stop. They will keep coming for you. And that's exactly what the threat actors do. They don't stop. Yeah, and that's a, this is another area of AI where they're using AI yes. for, for bad things. I think it's the technical term for it. Um, yes. AI-powered attacks. So yes. using AI to also help enhance their ability to perform attacks against organizations. Yeah, there was a really good example where they were using the latest model of ChatGPT. I think it was 4.4 or 4.5. They gave it all of the CVE information and without any other assistance, ChatGPT was able to develop an exploit for a recently disclosed right. CVE vulnerability. And it was able to do it for, I believe the number is over 75% of the vulnerabilities that were disclosed. So threat actors are going to do the same thing. Yep. When CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, releases a vulnerability or the actually the National Vulnerability Database that does that, the threat actors are going to leverage this wealth of information that these large language models have to accelerate their development of exploits for these vulnerabilities. And it's a big risk for organizations that don't have a good patch management program. If you are not patching your external uh, devices, your attack surface, your external attack surface, on a regular basis, you are leaving yourself vulnerable to the attackers because they have this quick ability to develop an exploit for these vulnerabilities. They're also utilizing some machine learning yes. um, to help them with the decision tree flow that you would come across during a, an actual attack. If we see these four or five different indicators, maybe we'll go down this path or this path. It builds a decision tree for them and helps automate a lot of that work. The attackers. For, right. Yeah, for the attacker side. How do defenders push back against that? How do they fight that? We're almost at that mad magazine spy versus spy where <laughs> the attacker- you have, to, you have to have a bomb to fight against a bomb. The good cybersecurity companies out there that are providing the defenders, the blue team with their tools are adopting the you know, AI capabilities the same way that the threat actors are. Say your firewall or maybe your web application firewall detects a sequence of attack and it's using multiple IP addresses it's not going to be able to change the password or the accounts that are being targeted, but it can definitely let you know which accounts that are being tested are valid and send an alert to you. That automates it because uh, as anybody who's operated their own environment, the phrase that's used often is called the fog of more. 
Great. I have 10 right. different security tools providing alerts. And I now have, instead of 10 alerts, I now have 100 alerts. Right. And who am I going to assign to look at all those alerts? That's where AI comes in. AI comes in and says, we see these techniques, these uh, tactics, and these threats, and we're going to put them together because we know that if these things happen in this order, that's typical indicator or compromise attempt. And yep. then you can start to do that you know, orchestration and response, the store part of it, so that way you can defend yourself. I'm not saying that everybody has to immediately do a forklift upgrade on their firewalls, but you definitely <laughs> want to pay attention to your security vendors that you're already working with. How are you incorporating either machine learning, predictive analytics, or large language models with generative responses to help me defend against these advanced attacks? Yeah, and I, I love the term fog of more. <laughs> um, it, it's a great way to put it. it too many different systems in disparate places trying to look in different things and trying to keep up with the attacks is untenable. It's a, yes. absolutely unsustainable for a, an organization. They're going to miss things. Right. Attackers only have to be right once. Yeah, and it was interesting. I was listening to a security talk um, at RVA Sec. The, the, the speaker was pushing back against the, the thought that the, the attacker only has to be right once. And he said, well, the defender can catch the attacker in multiple different places. Right. And so... You can have a failure in one place, but if you have defense in depth, mm -hmm. then you can catch them in another place. People give the employees of any company a hard time and say that, you know, your employees are your weakest link. A, I think that's a bad message. I don't think you ever want to say that your employees are your weakest link because <laughs> most HR people that I talk to say our employees are our most valuable asset. If your employees are your most valuable asset, you should invest in training them. Well, you don't want it to seem hopeless. You don't want it to seem like it's inevitable. And I listened to the CISO series, which is this great series of podcasts. Most employees who are socially engineered and fall for some socially engineered email should have a technical control behind them to help capture Correct. that. Yep. So you have to implement the technical controls correctly. One of the best examples that it, that we all talk about is I can get probably 50% of any company to click on a phishing link because all I have to do is send out an email that says, here is your bonus. Please click on this link. Sure. People yeah. are going to, particularly if it comes out. But if you enough, have those technical controls to help implement additional layers of protection against them being able to click that link. I, I think that's really the spirit of saying the user is the weakest link in a network. But they're the most targeted. Let's motivate ourselves to, to put the technical controls in place where they they make a mistake or they accidentally click on something. It can happen at any point in time in anybody's career. So there should be some technical control that says this email came in, came from a domain that's only recently been registered. We're going to flag it as possibly suspicious. It has a link inside of that email. I want to have a tool that says I'm going to rewrite that link. So if you click on it, I'm going to have a chance to in intercept the traffic to see whether or not it looks suspicious as well. Yeah. So those are two technical controls you can put at the email level, which is where most social engineering occurs because it's so easy. And then you can also have a good technical control on the endpoint that says, hey, you just clicked on a link. It's trying to execute PowerShell. That's not normal for you, John. You know, <laughs> you're working the help desk and you don't normally run PowerShell. Yeah. And if that final control you mentioned is AI powered, uh, that can help with the, the decision-making process, that that user and entity uh, behavior analytics yes. problem that you would have in, in that particular instance where this is unusual activity for you. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Our endpoint protection software should have AI built into it for both predictive analytics to sure. say, yep. we've monitored John for the last 30 days or 365 days, whatever it is, and he never does this. So that's an anomaly. So we're going to set a flag and say, this is, we're going to continue to monitor this with a closer eye because he doesn't normally do this. Two, you know, it goes to the user, uh, end user behavior analytics, also an AI type of yep. uh, analysis. And then it can also do machine learning to say, we've seen, you know, regardless of what John does on a regular basis, we've seen that when this PowerShell command is executed, big red flag, we're going to sandbox it or we're going to prevent it completely, or we're going to take the endpoint off the network and only have our secure channel back so that way the help desk can manage John's device now that we know John's device is infected. Yeah, and some threats are low and slow. Having a, a, a large data set to have machine learning look across and come to some conclusions about what may or may not be happening with that large data set across all the employees is, is a great thing to have in play, I think. Let's talk a little bit about the user. Yes. Um, there are certain 
ways to to help with skills gaps and training yep. around whether there's uh, skilled professionals that are operating the cybersecurity, the AI driven cybersecurity tools, or even on the the endpoint user. Uh, what are some ways that companies can help address those needs? One of the nice things about some of the security vendors with their tools, they have a knowledge base built in mm -hmm. that says, I'm a junior engineer, I'm seeing this, I don't know what it is. So they can type in a prompt, conversational, a conversational yeah. prompt that says, I'm seeing this activity, what's going on? So sure. there, are, there are vendors out there that have incorporated that into their tool set. And you as the customer want to think about, hey, does my wireless vendor do that? Does my firewall vendor do that? Does my endpoint protection tool do that? You still want to check it because one of my biggest risks, as I said earlier on, is AI is not right all the time. Right. Human oversight. You got to have a little human oversight in there as well. Well, let's let's transition right into data privacy and governance, which is a fun wow. topic for all of us to talk about. How would uh, companies ensure that their AI systems uh, comply with regulations? They're not they're not putting data in there. They shouldn't be putting in there. So How there's at least three different things in that question. So there's yep. the, there's a concern for companies that haven't established a good AI policy, a good level of governance about how will the company use AI? Will they allow the marketing team to use uh, AI to generate sales information and flyers and respond to you know questions and queries with a chat bot online? I mean, that's one way that people want to be able to quickly address customer needs, or you probably want to limit the kind of content people can put into those chat bots and those large language models because Unless you have a really tightly constrained environment, everything you put into that model becomes part of the model. Yep. And there's not a good way to pull that back out. And this happened with Samsung. It happened with another large, massive global company. Samsung said you can't use it because people were uploading sensitive documents into these large language models. And now that proprietary you know, company information probably listed as confidential is now in a large language model that yep. anybody can pull out. And it's in those terms of use that, you know, anything you contribute will be part of our model and no, you can't get it back out once you put it in there. So there's, there's that external use that people have for AI. There's another concern that people should think about when they have AI is when you en enable a chatbot, there's examples of people negotiating with the chatbot to get an airfare price of a dollar sure. and purchasing a car at a ridiculously low amount. So you have to make sure that you have parameters around your chatbot, and there are ways to do it, but you have to think about it strategically before you just... The same way you would, you would program a web application to stop those things from happening you, would, happening, you would have to program your AI or at least put constraints around the AI model to keep it within those particular limits. Right. You yeah. want to have a boundary check and say, we're never going to sell an airline ticket for less than $300 or whatever number you wanted to come up with. We're never going to sell a car for less than, and in this case, you would probably put in something like, we will never sell a car for less than the invoice price. And you could have that tied to your invoice database so that you know right. what that number is. Mm -hmm. Not impossible to do, but it's it's more complicated than just <laughs> signing. Than just turning on and, and, and <laughs> let's let's load data into LLM. Yes, exactly. Right. And, and using your credit card to pay for it because purchasing didn't allow you to do it because you didn't go through your third-party risk management. That's a whole other problem. Sure. So at a minimum, there would be those two things that you want to look at. And the other part of, well, I'll add the third one, which is for every query that you're feeding into that chat bot, there's going to be an expense to that. Mm -hmm. OpenAI wants to make money and they make money by, they call it tokens. They have different pricing models. You can buy a thousand tokens. So that could be, and that token isn't one question. That's the words that are put into the chat bot. Mm -hmm. So you can have a, a adversary. It could be a competitor who says, oh, they just put up a chat bot. I think I'm going to upload Moby Dick and see how expensive that is as a chat for blow out their tokens and blow out their tokens right. and suddenly the bill. same way same way it would happen with the cloud consumption model where right. exactly. the previous attack technique was they've allowed us to spin up EC2 instances. Let's just spin up a thousand of them. Yes. Let's overload this particular process and and really destroy their their AWS bill. It's not the thousand dollars they had budgeted. It's now one hundred thousand dollars and AWS will be like. You signed Sorry. the contract. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate you having a conversation with me about all those, those AI topics within cybersecurity. It's a big hot topic these days. I think we just want to wrap it up by saying, what are some of the main points that organizations can think about when discussing AI within the organization to help make sure they're secure? What are the, give me just some bullet points there. 
have a plan, figure out what you're trying to accomplish to do a risk assessment. And NIST has a really nice AI risk assessment model that you can use. It's free, it's available. You can go to nist.gov. So you wanna do a risk assessment and you want to make sure that you have an architecture for implementing it and be aware of the risks to your environment if you implement it. And I would also make sure that you communicate that out. So you wanna plan, you wanna prepare, you wanna test, you want to deploy safely after you've tested, and you want to make sure that you have constraints and ways to turn it off if it goes sideways, and you want to have a way to do that without taking down the rest of your organization. Well, it's important to keep up with AI advancements as they come along, new new models, new ways to put those things out there, new threats, new defender capabilities. So we just want to make sure that organizations understand that it's, it's not a problem that can't be taken on, that can't be tackled, Correct. but it is something that you need to keep up with. Security can be a value proposition and a differentiator in the marketplace. If you can tell your customers, we've implemented chat GPT like a uh, tool and we are protecting your data, yes. Mr. Customer, if you yes. sign up with us because we have put it in our own instance, that will be a more expensive uh, solution for you. I can guarantee that. But because touching back real quickly on the privacy point, the United States unfortunately has a patchwork of privacy laws. Um, and some of the privacy laws, in particular in the state of California and some of the other states, have laws that say you have the right as a consumer to be forgotten, which means you have to get that data out of your generative model. Yep. You have to know how to get the data out <laughs> before you put it in. Otherwise, you're going to have to do a hard reset, which can be in a very expensive yep. process. Well, John, thanks so much for taking time to talk with me today about this. I'm sure we'll have more discussions in the future, but uh, no this, doubt. Is, uh, this has been a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Same here.